So today, the Fifth Circuit heard oral arguments on the constitutionality of the ATF's pistol brace rule. So let's talk about this. But really quick before we jump into this video, if you think the ATF's pistol brace rule is clearly invalid and unconstitutional, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe. Also want to mention that currently my four year anniversary here on YouTube is approaching. Um, it's been crazy that we're here for four years and thank you guys so much for all of your support. But if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing to the channel. Help me to reach one of my goals, which is to reach 550,000 subscribers by that four year anniversary. But regardless, thank you guys so much for all of your support and for the four years here on YouTube. So like I mentioned in the intro, in this video, we're gonna be talking about the Fifth Circuit or arguments that just took place today in the Mock v. Garland case. And the Mock v. Garland case deals with the ATF's pistol brace rule. You may remember that recently the Fifth Circuit and a three judge panel issued an injunction and clarification in the FPC lawsuit Mock v. Garland. In that recent order and that clarification, the Fifth Circuit panel stated that an injunction was in fact granted in favor of the plaintiffs in those cases, and that covered maximum defense, some individual plaintiffs, and then also FPC and their members. After the Fifth Circuit issued that order in the Mock case, GOA in their Texas lawsuit sought a similar type of protection in the district court that they were in, they got that injunction, and then you also had SAF do the same thing. Um, currently, the NRA is trying to join that lawsuit. So there are multiple organizations right now who have temporary injunctions, and really that's because right now there is a lawsuit pending before the Fifth Circuit, which is that mock case, and today we had those oral arguments. This case was heard before judges Jerry R. Smith, Stephen Higginson, and then Don Willett. Now, this hearing covered a lot of things. It happened this morning, but the general tone, I would say, is that the judge seemed to be very fair. Both all the judges were very fair. Um, they pushed back against both sides and both arguments. So I wouldn't say it leaned significantly in one way or the other. One of the threshold issues is, of course, whether the ETF has the authority to create this type of rule. The ATF during the arguments claimed that this new pistol brace rule is purely interpretive. The ATF's attorney claims that their position is that under the NFA, these braced pistols have always been SBRs, they've always been SBRs, and the possession of them has always been a violation of the NFA. The ATF claims that this new rule simply is an effort to get the community's input on this topic and to kind of interpret what the statute is for the public. Interestingly, the court actually pushed back against that statement. Many of the judges asked the ATF if this rule is simply just interpretation of the statute as it is, then why did the ATF even have to do this? Why would the ATF have to put forward a new rule, get comments from the public if this is how it's always been, and they're simply just interpreting the statute how they always have? Essentially, this was the judges calling the ATF on their BS, that we all know that this was an effort by the ATF to legislate and to create new laws, and that this simply wasn't just an interpretation by the ATF of something that's always been the case. Then there were some back and forth on how the ATF went about creating this new rule. One of the main sticking points for this whole rule and this whole lawsuit is the fact that originally the ATF proposed in the proposed rulemaking, uh, they included something called the Worksheet 4999. That worksheet had specific criteria that gave out points based on what characteristics your firearm had. And if you got a certain amount of points, then the ATF said that they would consider it to be an uh, SBR. During the common period, many of us opposed the worksheet because it was overly broad. It made it so that almost every brace pistol would be considered an SBR. In response, the ATF ditched the entire worksheet and created a more broader and subjective standard. One of the challenges in this lawsuit is whether that drastic shift is a violation of the APA's procedure and whether the final pistol brace rule was a logical outgrowth from the proposed rule that we all commented on. Here, the ATF struggled to show how the final rule, the language in the final rule was not broader than the worksheet. In fact, one of the judges made a statement that he believed it was in fact broader and more subjective than the worksheet 4999. That same judge, I believe, also questioned the ATF on the fact of how they could claim that these firearms have always been SBRs when there was prior letters by the ATF expressly stating that a pistol with a brace attached could never be considered to be an SBR. To that, the ATF attorney said, well, it depends on the specific brace in question. That was the same answer that the ATF's attorney gave when the judges asked if there is any pistol brace when attached to a firearm that would not make that firearm into an SBR. The ATF said, yes, there are some, but we all know that's not true. The way that this rule is written as it stands right now, 
pretty much like 99.9% .9 of all braced pistols would be considered SBRs, and there's really no evidence that the ATF would treat them any other way. There was also discussion during the or arguments about the rule of lenity and then also the recent Cargill decision which dealt with bump stocks. The ATF, of course, was opposed to any use of the rule of lenity, which isn't surprising. They also argued that the text of the NFA made it very clear that these types of braced pistols are not braced pistols, but they are actually rifles or SBRs. And they claim that there is no ambiguity in the text of the NFA. Then there was some focus on the constitutional questions about um, the Second Amendment, how it's implicated in this case, and then also the Supreme Court's recent ruling in Bruin. Both sides really argued that this case could likely be resolved on the uh, APA questions, but if it gets to the Second Amendment question, the plaintiffs here, the attorneys for the pro-gun side, argue that these are clearly arms protected by the text of the Second Amendment. They are not dangerous and unusual items despite what the ATF claims. The ATF in their section of the Second Amendment question claim that these items are in fact dangerous and unusual items because they claim they are more accurate and more lethal with a stabilizing brace attached to them. But on that argument, there was some pushback by the court. And the court said, well, how could you argue that these are more dangerous and unusual when you are just simply adding a brace that makes them more accurate and also makes them less concealable? How does that make them more dangerous? And again, the ATF really didn't have a good response to that. Now, one of the last things that I wanna cover on the oral arguments was the questions asked by the judges about what type of relief slash injunction should the court grant? They asked if they should simply extend the injunction for a longer period of time and only cover maybe the individual plaintiffs, FBC and their members. Should they issue an injunction that only covers maybe the Fifth Circuit or maybe the states like Texas? Or should they issue a nationwide injunction that could be issued by the court and cover everyone within the entire nation? The plaintiff's attorneys during the oral arguments argued for a broader injunction, a nationwide injunction, and the claim is this would help to avoid this weird scenario that we're in right now and even going forward where the ATF has to maybe go to someone, um, require that they prove that they are a member of one of these orgs, or maybe even go to the orgs themselves and have to get a list of memberships. And so we're in a really weird uh, situation right now where again, only members of these organizations are covered. And the argument is that a nationwide injunction would not only protect more people, but also avoid this weird situation that we're currently in. The ATF obviously argued against the nationwide injunction. They argued against any injunction being granted by the Fifth Circuit. They said that they should vacate their current injunction, the temporary injunction that they have in place and to vacate the case back down to the district court. And one of their kind of fallback arguments was that at the very least, what the Fifth Circuit should do is vacate the case back down. Even if they say that Judge O'Connor should have issued the injunction, they should vacate the case, uh, vacate the current injunction, send the case back down to Judge O'Connor and let him re-rule on the injunction. So there was a lot more that happened during the hour and a half arguments. If you're interested, I will link it down below if you wanna to listen for yourself. But those are just some of my general takeaways to help you better understand what happened today during the oral arguments on the pistol brace rule. My general feeling is that I still think the panel is in our favor. I don't think it's going to be an overwhelming slam dunk decision for us. I don't think we're gonna get everything that we want. Um, I think maybe we will get a more limited injunction, potentially. I don't think we'll get a nationwide injunction. I hope I'm wrong on that fact. I hope we get a nationwide injunction, but I still think it will be a two to one decision in our favor. Again, that's what's happening right now in the pistol brace rule. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and comment down below and I'll try to answer the best of my ability. Also, if you like this video and you like to support the channel, one of the best ways to do that is to like, comment, and subscribe. All those things help to fuel the algorithm and it signals to YouTube that you guys see value in these videos and in this type of 2 news. As always, I want to thank everybody who likes, comments, subscribes, who hits the notification bell, who shares these videos. You guys are directly impacting these videos, impacting this channel, and helping me to reach and educate more people than I could ever do on my own. So as always, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And never forget this nation was built by armed scholars, and this nation will be maintained by armed scholars.